evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this, our first virtual Chagas National Sheep Conference. My name is Michael Godstein, and I'm head of the Sheep Knowledge Transfer Program in Chagask, and I'm your host for this evening. At the outset, I would like to call on our director, Professor Jerry Boyle, to open this year's Chagas National Sheep Conference. Over to you, Jerry. Hello, everyone. Jerry Boyle is, is my name, director of Chagask, and it's my privilege to welcome you to this year's virtual sheep conference. Um, and um, I, this year, our focus is very much going to be on the three principal drivers of competitiveness and sustainability in the sector, which are, of course, genetics, grassland management, and flock health. And the first thing I want to say is this has been, or last year was a good year for the sheep sector, uh, particularly because of the lift in, in prices, um, about 9%. And the Chagas National Farm Survey has indicated that uh, in 2019, the average gross margin of the predominant uh, sheep sec, uh, enterprise was 328 euro per hectare. And remember, that's before the addition, the addition of uh, the basic payment. And this uh, margin is substantially higher, of course, than the prevailing net margins in, say, beef production. And it's something that I've always been saying over the years, that um, the sheep sector is an attractive uh, option for many young farmers. And I would particularly commend it to new entrants into farming, to consider um, uh, investing in, in a sheep system. And we're consistently uh, in Chagask demonstrating that it's very possible to generate um, a stocking rate of 10 euros to the hectare. And, and I think that's something that needs to be borne in mind. When it comes to animal genetics, I think um, the evidence from the research work that's been ongoing in Chagas is very positive indeed and demonstrates that the high star index uh, compared to the low star index consistently generates higher uh, output per animal and also much lower output in terms of um, carbon dioxide equivalent or uh, greenhouse gas emissions and thus underscoring the huge importance of getting our genetics right. And secondly, from an Irish point of view, we know that the most efficient uh, feed for ruminant animals is grass. And this has been consistently shown in Chagas research over the years. And one um, finding that jumps out to me is that every extra ton of grass that is utilized is worth in the dry stock sector, taking beef and sheep together in excess of 100 euro uh, per hectare. And I think that illustrates the importance of farmers paying close attention to their grassland management. And of course, flock health is an absolute imperative. And again, this is something that my colleagues in research and advisory in Chagas have been paying attention to over the years and passing on uh, the implications of good, a good herd status to farm. Going back to the whole challenge around uh, greenhouse gases, and it's important to note, of course, that this, the sheep sector uh, has been managing its nutrients quite well certainly isn't an outstanding culprit in a wretched production of greenhouse gases. But nonetheless, there are huge opportunities to reduce the usage of chemical nitrogen in particular. And we are strongly advocating, based on research, of course, a more extensive use of white clover. And generally, we see opportunities for driving uh, nitrogen use efficiency by sound practices in relation to the management of nutrients like P and K. And of course, my colleagues continue to emphasize the importance of a uh, status on uh, grasslands. 
are, are being grazed by sheep. So I think the next, uh, the two days event are going to be very exciting. And uh, finally, I'd like to thank the entire Chagas sheep team uh, comprising my research and advisory colleagues for organizing uh, the event. And of course, I want to give a particular mention of appreciation to our speakers. Tonight, we have my colleague Nicola Featherstone and uh, also Professor Paul Kenyon from the World Round University of Massey in New Zealand. On Thursday night, we have Anya Bryan, also a colleague of ours in Chagas, and Ben Strognell, who's a veterinary practitioner hailing from the UK and who's engaged in a very interesting project with Beef and Lamb Levy Board. Thank you. Thank you, Director. So let's get this evening's um, proceedings underway. Tonight, we have two very interesting papers. Our speakers will present for 20 minutes each and we will take questions and answers at the end of the second presentation. You, the audience, can put your questions to our panelists by typing them in the question and answers function at the bottom of your screen. I will put your questions to our panelists on your behalf. Our first paper tonight covers an area of genetic comparison of high and low index sheep compared with elite New Zealand genetics this paper is being covered by Nicola Featherston, who is a wild scholar based at the Chagas Research Centre in Athenry. Nicola is from a sheep and suckler farm in Roscommon, and she went on to pursue a career in agriculture by enrolling in the animal science degree in UCD in 2013. On graduating in 2017, Nicola joined Chagas wild scholar team through the enrollment in a PhD entitled INZAC, an Irish and New Zealand animal comparison. Under supervision of Dr. Noreen McHugh and Dr. Fiona McGovern in Chagas and Associate Professor uh, Tommy Boland in UCD. Nicola's study involves not only the collection and analysis of a vast amount of data on the INZAC flock, including reproductive, lambing, yo and lamb growth, performance and productivity, but has also allowed her to travel to New Zealand for a three month period to link up with ag consultancy firm Abacus Bio and increase her knowledge in the area of New Zealand production systems. As our PhD draws to a close, Nicola will present some findings here to date. Over to you, Nicola. Hello there and welcome. My name is Nicola Feldston and I'm here today to discuss with you the INZAC study. INZAC stands for an Irish versus New Zealand animal comparison. The project has been underway in Chagas Rye since 2016. So a bit about myself. As Michael mentioned, I'm a UCD graduate. After finishing there in 2017, I joined Chagas, where I'm now in my final of four years studying my PhD. I'm usually based in Chagas Rye, along with where the INZAC block is situated, but I'm originally from a sheep and beef farm in County Roscommon. So you might ask why we decided to compare New Zealand genetics. Well, firstly, because of our similar production systems. They have a grass-based production system. They also have a seasonal lambing period, which leads to a volatile sheep industry, where lamb is plentiful in the summer months and in short supply over the winter. It's a predominantly export-focused market also, where 39% of their uh, lamb and mutton goes to China alone. At a breeding level, we've also some similarities. Although New Zealand have been working since the late in 1980s and early 1990s on developing indexes, they've developed the New Zealand Maternal Worth as their maternal index, which is similar to our Sheep Ireland Eurostar Replacement Index. Traits across these two indexes are similar and include lamb survival, reproduction, lamb growth, and young mature weight. New Zealand have a greater focus on wool, however, focusing in on quality there, while Ireland look at carcass and lambing needs. Previous research in New Zealand indicates that even though we have a similar production system and a similar breeding objective, New Zealand are achieving three times the rate of genetic gain to Ireland at the moment. So when we look at New Zealand again, we know that New Zealand's population has 
the yo population has decreased from 68 million in 1985 to 30 million in 2014. This massive decrease comes as they become more productive with lots of changes in genetics, production systems and management. Even though the yo population has changed dramatically, however, their output has remained consistent. They've done this through increasing their carcass weight from about 14 kilos in 1990 up to 19 kilos in 2017. They've also increased their lamin percentages by 20%. We also looked at countries who had a similar breeding structure to Ireland. We wanted to be able to source animals such as Suffolk's and Texels that were common in both countries. So the objective of the study, firstly, that we wanted to validate the Sheep Ireland Replacement Index. We wanted to assure you, the farmers, that if you were investing in superior genetics, that this would result in superior performance on farm. Secondly, we wanted to compare Irish and New Zealand genetics. So New Zealand were able to act as a benchmark for our Irish production system, although they have been um, although they have been investing in genetics for many years. Here we set out to look at any similarities or differences across the two countries. So the flock itself is comprised of 180 yos. The elite New Zealand group, which we imported from New Zealand in 2013 and 2014, and have since built up the flock, we also have a high Irish genetic group and a low Irish genetic group. Prior to the study, we had a pedigree flock in Athenry, but we've since increased this to represent the national flock in Ireland. Each of these three groups then are divided equally between Suffolk and Texel Yos, all of which are pedigree animals. When the study was established and the groups were set up, Yos that were classified as high Irish were five stars on the replacement index. Yos that were classified as low Irish were one star on the replacement index. The two groups were balanced across terminal traits, averaging a three star. So the flock itself. Our year starts at breeding season each year, where all yos are synchronized and laparoscopic AI'd. Yos are led to rams for two repeat cycles, which gives us a mean lambing date of the 8th of March. As you'll see from the picture here, the yos are housed, usually happens in December, and are auto winter shorn. When lambing occurs, lambs are tagged at birth and recorded. Here's some examples of how we do that using whiteboards and record cards. This information is then uploaded onto our TGM system and onto the Sheep Ireland database. It's also important to note that our maximum rearing type is two lambs per yoke. So any triplet lambs are placed into an artificial rearing unit or cross fostered onto another yoke within the same genetic merit group. Here's an example of some of the many phenotypes that we measure throughout the year, from lambing traits to yo intake, yo milk yield, lamb growth and drafting onto breeding back around the year again. This study has been operating from 2016 to 2019, a four year period. So after lambing, 48 hours approximately, yos and their lambs are let to grass. Here we can see highlighted in the blue, the New Zealand paddocks. Each of the groups have an allocated five hectare block, but these paddocks are divided and distributed across the farmland. This gives us a stocking rate of 12 yos per hectare, and this is operated in a rotational grazing system. So what did we find out? We'll now go through some of the results, starting with reproductive traits. From this point on, I'm going to display New Zealand in blue, High Irish in green, and Low Irish in red. Remembering that these High Irish animals were the five star and the Low Irish animals were one star. Here we see the results for conception rate for a service. We've achieved some excellent results averaging and 78% across the four years to laparoscopic AI. As I previously mentioned, we also let the yos to rams for two repeat cycles. So this results in a barren rate, averaging 7.6% across the three groups. When we look at litter size, 
there is a significant difference between that reported in New Zealand and the low Irish animals. This difference equates to up to 23 lambs per yo lambed. This then follows on, this trend follows on to weaning rate, where we can see New Zealand and high Irish yos rear a greater number of lambs at 1.34 for New Zealand and 1.26 for high Irish. This is greater than the low Irish who rear 1.11 lambs per yo joined. It's important to remember this trait is reported as the number of uh, lambs reared per yo joined and that this not, doesn't include any artificially reared lambs as we previously mentioned. We also looked at yo survival. So we, here we looked at the proportion of yos that survived from one year to the next, um, from lambing down in this year back around to breeding of the following year. 70% of New Zealand yos survived from year to year in comparison to 64 and 63.8% of the high and the low Irish animals. This difference between New Zealand and the low Irish equates to up to 6.6 .6 yos in every hundred every year. Next we'll look at the lambing traits that we recorded. Here's an example of a record card that we use to measure the traits. You can see in the top left corner birth assistance. So we rank uh, where we rank each of the yos based on their lambing assistance, whether it's lambed without help, a little help, or a manual delivery or a difficult delivery. We also give an assistance reason, as you'll see on the top right, as to why they required assistance if they did. We also score mothering ability on a one to three scale, and also look at lamb viability, which is if the lamb is able to get up and suck their first feed unassisted, or if they require assistance at that time. So firstly, we look at lambing difficulty. Here in New Zealand, yos were significantly easier lamb, with 13% of their yos requiring a considerable, considerably difficult lambing. The Irish rates then were almost double this at 24%. These results aren't uh, far from what we expected, as New Zealand animals are, came from this outdoor production system where minimal assistance was offered at lambing. We also looked at the yo's mothering ability. Here there was no difference between the three groups, averaging 76%. This was scored on how easy the yo followed her lambs from a group pen into an individual lambing pen. We also looked at litter vigor. So as I mentioned, how easily the lamb can get up and suck themselves. 51% of New Zealand litters required assistance to be sucked at lambing time. This is uh, compared to 65% of the high Irish litters and 69% of the low Irish litters. This means that there's a difference of 1.5 to 2 litters between the Irish and the New Zealand animals. Perinatal lamb mortality, which is mortality in the first 24 hours after birth, also ranged from 4.7 to 6.7%. There was no difference between the three groups uh, statistically, but rates were lower than reported previously in pedigree flocks, which have reached up to 12% on average. Next, we'll look at the lamb performance, particularly on lamb groves and drafting. So birth to 40 days. At birth, there was no difference between the birth weight of the three groups. This was at 5.3 kilograms. As they grew from birth to 40 days, New Zealand lambs grew at a rate of 312 grams per day. This was greater than the rate of either Irish group, whether high or low, averaging between 303 and 305 grams per day. Then when we look at 40 days to weaning, the live weight at 40 days averaged 17.1 kilo, where there was no difference between the three groups. Lambs from the New Zealand group grew at a rate of 271 grams per day. This was significantly greater than either of the Irish groups, again, at 261 and 258 grams per day. Then when we look at from weaning to drafting, the weights here are weaning weights for the three groups. It's not surprising that the average daily gain and the 
has accumulated into an increase or superior weaning weight for the New Zealand animals, averaging at 32.9 kilograms. This was greater than either of the Irish groups at 31.9 and 37 or 31.7. Here we can see the average daily gain again. So New Zealand lambs grew at a rate of 243 grams per day compared to the high Irish at 215 grams per day. Both these groups performed better than the low Irish animals who grew at a rate of 193 grams per day. This then had a knock-on effect to the days to drafting. Although it's important to note here that we don't slaughter very many lambs as majority are kept for uh, replacements within the flock, we can see differences between the three groups when they were drafted, at, when they were hit as hitting their targets as fit for slaughter. So between New Zealand and low Irish animals, there's up to 13 day difference. And between high and low Irish animals, there's up to an eight day difference. Next, we'll look at the drafting pattern. Our first draft for uh, these groups coincides with weaning in June. Here we can see the rates are similar across the three groups. By the end of July, the same trend has followed on. But by the end of August, we, the New Zealand animals have reached up to 83% drafted. The Irish animals are also doing quite well at 75% and 76% drafted but there is a 10% difference here between the two groups. By the end of September, where we aim to have at least 70% of our animals drafted, we've surpassed this very well by reaching, target, or reaching rates of 86 to 92%. Here we can see that the New Zealand and the high Irish lambs were finished quicker than the low Irish lambs. After this time point, we can see that results plateau out into October and November, but New Zealand are the first group to reach their 100% target. So we also measure ultrasound scanning. As I mentioned previously, because we don't uh, kill very many lambs, we use the ultrasound scanning as a proxy for how they would perform for carcass confirmation and fat score. Here we can see that the New Zealand animals score greater than the high Irish and the low Irish animals. This indicates that New Zealand genetic suitability within the Irish uh, finishing system. And now we'll look at the productivity performance across the three groups. Firstly, we'll look at the total number of lambs born. So this is accumulated over a four year period that the study operated on. Between New Zealand and low lambs, there's a difference of 0.7 lambs. And between the high and the low Irish, there's a difference of 0.36 lambs. This trend also follows on to the number of lambs reared per year. There's a difference of 0.43 lambs between New Zealand and low, and a difference of 0.35 lambs between high and low. We also looked at live weight as a proxy for yield performance. So the greater the amount of lamb reared in comparison to the yo's weight, the more efficient she is. Here we can see some measures at 40 days post lambing. So the New Zealand and the high Irish animals are, are producing 260 grams of lamb per kilo of their own live weight. This is in comparison to the low Irish at 213 grams. If we take, for example, three yos weighing 75 kilos, the difference between the New Zealand and the low Irish animals equates to up to 3.6 kilograms in litter live weight at 40 days. The same applies between the high Irish and the low Irish animals. Next, we'll look at the dry matter intake. So we also recorded this at six weeks or 40 days post lambing. Um, the N-alkene bolusing technique is what was used. This involves administering one of the boluses here pictured to each yo for 12 consecutive days. The last six days of this, fecal samples are collected. An analysis carried out in the lab is able to determine the quantity of grass that the yo ate that day. 
On average, our rates were between 2.2 and 2.4 kilos of dry matter per day across the three groups. When we look at how the yews are able to convert this intake into litter live weight, we can see that New Zealand yews are more efficient. For every kilogram of grass dry matter that they take in, they produce 244 grams of lamb live weight. This is greater than either of the Irish groups who produce 206 and 181 grams per kilo of intake. This is measured at 40 days post lambing also. So to summarize, we've grouped some of the trades here to simplify the overall results. We can see that for litter size, New Zealand animals are superior to the high and the low Irish. But for the number of lambs reared, New Zealand and high Irish animals are superior to the low Irish animals. When we group lambing trades together, we can see that the New Zealand animals are superior to both Irish groups, particularly in litter vigour and in lambing difficulty. When we look at lamb growth, we can see that New Zealand and high Irish animals perform quite well, particularly post weaning, where the average daily gain and the days to slaughter are favourable compared to the low Irish animals. And finally, our efficiency traits. So here we measure things like the total number of lambs born and reared and the live weight and intake comparisons. New Zealand and the high Irish animals two were superior to the low Irish animals at this time point. While there are differences between many traits, it's important to note that further development of the national indexes is still required so that we can continue to improve and become more efficient and productive. Thank you very much for your time. I'd like to thank my supervisors, Noreen McHugh, Fiona McGovern and Tommy Boland. I'd like to thank the organising committee for the SHEEP conference this year. And I'd also like to pay particular uh, thanks to all the staff and students at Chagasath and Rye who were involved in the data collection for my study. If you have any questions after this, you can email me at nicola.felston at chagas.ie. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nicola. That was a very interesting paper, clearly showing that there are significant genetic differences that affect lamb performance. Can I remind our audience that if they wish to ask a question of any of the speakers, they can do so using the chat function on Zoom. And I will then ask that question to the various speakers on their behalf at the end of our next session. So after the second paper. Our second paper tonight looks at the New Zealand experience of finishing lambs off herbage-based diets. It's very topical for sheep farmers in Ireland as concentrate feed is our largest single variable cost on Irish sheep farms. This paper will be delivered by Professor Paul Kenyon from Massey University. And Paul is a professor of sheep husbandry um, at Massey University in New Zealand and is head of the School of Agriculture and Environment. He grew up on a sheep and beef farm and has more than 20 years of experience in sheep research in New Zealand and internationally. Specific research programs include maximizing yo lamb or hogget breeding performance, the management of twin and triplet bearing yos and their offspring in pregnancy and lactation, developing yo body condition score guidelines, effects of body size on the efficiency of production in sheep, alternative feed types to improve sheep performance, maximizing yo milk production and farmer learning. These research projects are undertaken at both the basic biological science level and at a farm systems and applied level, he works collaboratively with farmers, industry, and veterinarians throughout New Zealand, and is a regular presenter at industry and farmers events. So over to you, Paul. Thank you, Michael, and welcome everyone this evening. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak tonight. My presentation is very much uh, at the applied level. It lacks a lot of data on purpose because I want to really just give summaries of the guidelines that we give New Zealand farmers in terms of the feeding levels that they should be feeding their sheep when grazing herbage. I'll also only focus on two types of herbage, uh, ryegrass white clover, which is a predominant herbage mix, and a herd clover mix uh, containing chicory, plantain, red and white clover. 
just a few points of clarification at the start. The New Zealand farming system prides itself on being an outdoor low cost system. So predominantly our sheep are uh, grazing herbage all year round, outdoors. There's very little to no use of any type of grain supplementation. And it's a rotational grazing system where the sheep are generally moved in groups or mobs around paddocks throughout the year as a me mechanism to control intakes and pasture quality or herbage quality, the exception being during the lambing period. On average, less than 7% uh, of the farm would have some type of green feed cropping that would be, uh, sheep would be using for intake. So predominantly, well over 90% is a grass clover mix, predominantly ryegrass white clover. And I just want to finish by saying, before I get into the talk, in New Zealand, when we talk about pasture mass, our measurement is to the ground level. So I'll give some pasture mass, kilograms of dry matter per hectare values, just remember that's to the ground level. There's various countries have various measures of that. Just a, also a bit of a basic principle to start with, if you want high performance in animals, and in this case your sheep, you've got to have some basic uh, management understanding and principles in terms of how to do that when they're consuming herbage. If you're going to perform at a high level, you cannot restrict their intake. Every time they bite the herbage, you want to maximise their intake or fill their mouth. There's only so many bites in it that they can do in a day because they're ruminant and have to ruminate. You want to give the, the animal the ability to choose what it wants to consume. Just like you choose every time you, know, you consume your meal, you don't just eat the same thing every time, you actually do have a mix of both, in general, um, a range of uh, meat and vegetables. Sheep are no different, they want to have a mixed diet. And you want to ensure that the herbage is of higher quality because there's a maximum amount of feed they can consume in a 24 hour period. If you want to maximize the energy and protein they get in that feed, the feed itself has to be of high quality. And just a little diagram there, at the two diagrams here at the bottom of the slide, just showing you, you know, both of those have uh, conditions where feed may not be restricted, but the one on the right has um, is a diagram really of grass that yes, their intake wouldn't be uh, restricted, but it's of, uh, gone reproductive, mature, so the quality will be less. So even though you might consider there's a lot of feed in, in the paddock, and um, what they're consuming will be limiting their performance level. And I'll touch on that as we go throughout the presentation. So it's actually quite simple in some respects. It's always very easy for me to say that because I'm not working on a farm, but we know after more than 30 years of study that under New Zealand ryegrass, white clover grazing conditions, if you want to maximize intake, you cannot allow the animal to graze below four centimeters sward height or 1200 kilograms of dry matter per hectare. Remember we we're measuring that to the ground level. But at the same time, you don't want to allow the animal to be grazing much above eight to 10 centimetres or 1800 to 2400 kilograms of dry matter, especially in the summer autumn period, because in that period of the year, if the herbage is that high, a grass clover mix, you'll actually be getting a poor quality herbage, poor quality grass, and therefore what they're consuming Yes, they might better fool their mouth, but it'll be of poor quality. So that's the optimum window, that going in at eight centimetres or so and coming out of that paddock at four centimetres in the rotation if you want to maximise uh, intake and therefore performance. And of course, you can't do that on a whole farm system because across the farm, you'll have paddocks of different heights. Depending on the season, you'll have higher or lesser ability to grow herbage. And of course, that herbage will uh, differ in quality. So you never actually have enough herbage on farms. And in our farm of farming system, of course, we don't bring in supplement uh, to, to buffer against that. What we do is we try to predict at any given time which class of stock would benefit the most for being in those grazing uh, guidelines to get high performance and what other classes of stock can maybe buffer against that and have a graze to lower levels or get a lesser intake with minimal to no impact on their performance. The other feed type I'm going to talk mainly about during this presentation is a herb clover mix, which the area that our group has been working on is, is a plantain chicory red and white clover mix. That was done based on a number of studies over many years to come up with, and in our conditions, an, an optimal mix. 
And in terms of the various studies across many sites over many years have shown that if you want to maximize the performance of both the herbage itself and the animal, never grows graze below eight centimeters sward height. And once you've grazed down to that level, you rotate them into a new paddock or new area. And they don't go back to that same area till at least the sward has grown back to 16 centimeters at least, or it's been rested for three to four weeks because what you want is a herb clover mix that's productive, yes, when the animals are on it, but it's persistent for at least four to seven years. At least, and if you don't keep the uh, sward in that kind of optimum window of never going below eight centimeters and spelling it, what happens is, yes, you might get high performance from the animals for a short period, but that mix will die out. We also, under most conditions in New Zealand, uh, the plantain and chicory can be damaged by winter grazing. So we have a period of late winter of not grazing that area of land for a couple of months. And that's about ensuring the plant species when that mix survive for many years so that you get high performance and you're not having to uh, reinvest in replanting that plant. It's a rotational grazing system. And as I said, if you follow those guidelines, you should get four to seven years out of that mix. The other thing to think about is, is how to manage the animals on and off that area. And it can be done over a five to seven day period because you want time for the rumen to adjust onto it. And of course, for the rumen to adjust off. And that's basically done by a two hour adaption period, one day going to four hours the next day, six hours, et cetera, et cetera. The thing you have to do if you're gonna to go to a mix like this is have a bit of a leap of faith at the start. We have to plant enough of it to allow for a rotational grazing system. If you don't, what you end up doing is either having animals on and off all the time and they spend a lot of time adjusting their rumen and therefore performance is poor. Or what you end up doing is grazing that smaller area too much and actually end up killing the plant. So what I'm gonna talk about next for the remainder of the talk is using mainly ryegrass white clover, because as I said, well over 90% of our farm are covered, in, are covered in, in grass and clover, predominantly ryegrass. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that herb mix as well, but how you maximize lamb growth. And lamb growth, of course, is not just about feeding the lamb well post weaning, it's actually starting the year before when their mother has just weaned her previous set of lambs, making sure she's fed well through her production year will actually affect how heavy that lamb is itself at weaning and, and also how well it'll perform. So it's actually a 12 month process if you wanna maximize lamb growth. So what do we recommend our farmers do? Well, at the weaning of their lambs, which occurs for us uh, in uh, late spring, early summer, predominantly around December, their body condition score they use to de determine the condition the ewes are in. And then over the summer, autumn period, have a split flock targeted feeding approach where they take off the ewes of poor condition and feed them in a rotation, predominantly through that grass clover and grazing down to three centimetres or about 900 kilograms of dry matter. And under those conditions, yes, intake is a bit restricted, but it's above maintenance feeding level and they gain conditions going into the next breeding to maximise their reproductive performance and ensure they have body condition going into pregnancy. The rest of the flocks, so that those use in better condition, they're grazing down a lot lower in the sward. So it's obviously in a rotation generally, almost in a truck and trailer type approach and behind the other ewes. They're grazing lower down to two centimetres, so down to maintenance type feeding level. And what that's doing, of course, is restricting how much they eat because you have other classes of stock on the farm that you want at high levels of feeding at that time, predominantly lambs, weaned lambs. But it's also cleaning up that herbage so that fresh, good quality stuff grows out of that two centimetres and gets above that into that four to eight centimetre range. So then the lambs can rotate the weaned lambs back in behind that group. And that type of system carries through uh, into breeding. Often the ewes are, are managed as one group during breeding and only grazing down to that 900 kilograms of dry matter or three centimetres. And then once the breeding is finished during pregnancy, um, they, they go back into say that rotation of grazing down to two centimetres. And then the next decision is made based on pregnancy status and the information we have when it comes to pregnancy scanning and rid pregnancy. And we tell our farmers to utilize information they get from pregnancy scanning, the number of fetuses, body cushion score they use again, and hopefully also they've either used mating harnesses 
at breeding to identify which of those ewes that are going to lamb early or later in the lambing period, or maybe they're getting that information collected by ultrasound scanning. And then using that combined set of information of pregnancy status in terms of number of fetus early versus late lambing and the body condition score of ewes, start to prioritize the ewe flock maybe into two or three groups. And especially based on those ewes, we know that we'll need extra feed in late pregnancy or in poor condition. And so again, it's a rotational system and a hierarchical uh, situation based on uh, the condition of the ewe and those poor condition, multiple bearing ewes, grazing down to that three centimeters, around that 900 kilograms of dry matter. Remembering we measure that to ground level. So they're gaining a bit of live weight and a bit of condition. Because remember in mid-pregnancy, they can contain a bit of condition, whereas in late pregnancy, they can't. So you're gaining some condition so they've got that buffer in late pregnancy and lactation. And the rest of the flock, um, are being pushed a bit harder down towards two centimeters, and they tend to be your um, poor condition ewes and those that are single, be sorry, your better condition ewes, those that are single bearing and those that are lambing in late pregnancy. Then what we do is we keep that rotation going, and I should say also there is never enough feed on our farms in, in uh, winter. So the size of those individual mobs, those that are grazing down to three centimetres versus those that are grazing down to two centimetres, is really based on how much feed the farmer has on hand in terms of looking how much pasture he has available or her has available and predicting how much pasture they're going to grow in the next two month period. In late pregnancy, we know from a number of studies from day 130 of pregnancy, from an individual use day 130 of pregnancy, we cannot be restricting our intake, so we can't be grazing below that four centimetres or 1,200 kilograms of dry matter per hectare. And ideally, in the perfect situation, all of the ewes would be, would be not grazing below that level. And again, as I said, New Zealand's a low cost, cost farming system, and we're clearly this is in late winter because we lamb in either very late winter or early spring, and often on our farms, we don't have enough herbage to allow that to occur for every you, if we're perfectly honest. So it's again thinking about a hierarchical approach. Which use can cope with being pushed a bit harder? Obviously, your singleton bearing use can, because they have a greater ability to buffer, and your later or second cycle or third cycle use. Because while the first lambing use might be a day 130 of pregnancy, your second cycle use, at best, they're going to be, say, day 113 and even later use or even less of pregnancy. So they can be forced to be grazed a bit lower. Because again, it's about thinking about how much feed you have on offer then, making sure you have the amount of feed you wanna have when lambing occurs. We do not at this in New Zealand bring in supplements at this time if we have low pasture cover. What we instead do is focus on which use can cope with being slightly behind those optimal conditions. I would say, however, what is common on many of our farms in early to mid-pregnancy is the use of brassica crops, pure swords of either things like swedes, turnips or kale, or sometimes a kale swede or a kale turnip mix, and they are used in early to mid-pregnancy um, to provide a large feed source to be feeding ewes in a relatively small area. You know, a farmer might put in three to five percent, sometimes seven percent of his farm in this area, so that what he's doing there is the aim of resting his pasture so that covers uh, increased during that winter period, that mid to late pregnancy period, uh, in early to mid pregnancy period. So in late pregnancy, the covers are there where we want them to be. We don't use those brassicas. Remember, they're grazing these in situ and paddock in late pregnancy because the inability of those brassicas, especially the bulb-based ones, to provide enough quality dry matter to the animal. When it comes to lactation, our guidelines are very simple. And as I said to you at the start, our pasture cover guidelines are very simple because regardless of physiological state or the age of the animal, if you want to maximise intake, it's that four to eight centimetre range. So what we tend to do on our farms in a week to two weeks before lambing, use a set stock. So they're coming off rotation and they're placed in individual paddocks, which they'll pretty much remain in until weaning. And what farmers do is they look at the individual pasture covers in those paddocks, because each paddock and a farmer might have 30, 40 paddocks on their farm, 
Each paddock will be of different cover because remember the ewes have been going through a rotation in winter. So some paddocks might've been grazed three weeks ago, two weeks ago, some six or seven weeks ago. So they have different pasture heights or masses. And then they think about how many each, how many ewes can be left in each of those paddocks to ensure during that lactation period that pasture cover stays within that optimum window of that four to eight centimeters or 12 to 1800 kilograms of dry matter. And so what they do is they work out based on theoretical, theoretical requirements, how many ewes can be placed per hectare. And that'll differ based on the cover that's currently in that farm, uh, in that paddock it's set stocking, and whether they use a single twin or triplet bearing. Because our farmers tend to lamb single twin and triplet bearing ewes in different paddocks. So in other words, if all the paddocks had the same pasture mass or cover in them, there'd be less ewes per hectare triplets, slightly more twins, and then a lot more singles. Now, in a scenario where the farmer, because the winter's been harsh, does not have enough pasture to ensure that all ewes can be set stocked within the optimum window, it's again thinking about which ewes can be pushed a bit harder and be, for, be forced to graze a bit lower. And that's clearly a singleton bearing ewes because they have a great ability to buffer because their lambs require less milk, or our later lambing ewes. So a later second or third cycle ewes, of course, uh, still a few more weeks away from lambing, and hopefully by the time they do lamb, they will be in a situation where the pasture is grown because we're fully in spring, and therefore it's growing up underneath them. I would say, and I should have said at the start, an important thing when you're in a pasture-only based system is the timing of breeding. The timing of breeding controls feed demand, and so you do not want to breed too early and put yourself in a situation that there's not enough herbage in late pregnancy and lactation. So thinking about when your pasture really is starting to grow in spring, that's when you should be lambing. You can use this, the herb mix I talked about, the chicory, plantain, ryegrass, white clover mix, and it is used by many of our farmers for lambing, and it can increase you and lamb performance. Depends how you use these. Follow the same guidelines I talked about before, not ensuring pasture covers don't go below eight centimetres. Farmers have to set stock on those from say a week or two before lambing till about three or four weeks post lambing and then a rotation occurs. In some parts of the country if they're early lambing and it's in late winter, farmers can't lamb on these. So they lamb on ryegrass white clover and then walk the ewes and lambs onto these mixes at three to four weeks of age. In other parts of the country where they're lambing more in spring, they can lamb on these feeds and they can be increased performance in either scenario. Then we get to the weaned lamb management. I spent most time on the ewe and you'll be wondering, well, we're supposed to talk about lamb management. Why is he talking about ewe management? Because the pasture guidelines are exactly the same. You're not wanting to limit intake and I've told you what those pasture covers are for ryegrass white clover and what they are for the herd mix. And of course, we want our lambs growing as fast as possible because we want them slaughtered as early as possible because then they'll consume less feed and they'll require less other costs in terms of uh, labour costs, animal health costs, they'll be less exposed to animal health issues, and they'll produce less greenhouse gas. And of course, we want our replacement ewe lambs growing as fast as possible also, because they'll consume less feed, it gives you more options with them, and you may better breed them at a younger age. So as I've said to you before, when I started talking about uh, how we manage our ewes post the weaning of their lambs, of course, those ewes then are actually setting up the pasture for their lambs that they've just weaned. So they're in a rotation, those ewes, and their lambs are a few weeks behind following grazing the, the pasture that those ewes grazed down to two centimetres, which has now grown up into that optimum range of four to eight centimetres or 1,200 to 18 kilograms of uh, dry matter per hectare. Ideally, there's a high clover content in there, and you're in a rotational grazing system here because you want a fresh pick. You want those lambs in the paddock just for a few days. They go in, uh, eat the best quality stuff. Remember, they will pick things like the clover and the best quality grass. You do not want to leave them in the paddock for weeks at a time thinking, oh, they're in the optimum window. But what's really happened, if you're, they're still in the optimum window, the herbage quality has declined because in the first few days, they've gone and picked the good stuff. And what's left is, yes, it's of good length, but it's of less quality. And as I said, other classes of stock, then follow them around and clear up that pasture. The herb, herb clover mix is used also as a means of growing lambs faster, and it works in all seasons of the year, except for those two uh, months in late winter, and it results in high lamb growth rates, higher carcass weights, 
higher dressing out percentages, and you end up with more lamb carcass per hectare and per season. And it's keeping in that, that optimum range that I talked about, you know, not going in above 24 centimetres, but at least at 16 centimetres and coming out at that eight centimetres. There is a conflict, of course, when farmers, they look at those herb clover mixes and say, there's a lot of feed, they're at eight centimetres. I want them to eat more, but if you do that, you will, yes, get higher performance still probably your lambs, but you'll impact on the performance of that crop. So you can't get both. So this is just a, the only pictures I've got. Here are three pictures here, and all of those show green herbage. And many of our farmers would say, well, the animals will perform well in all of those scenarios. And the, the big picture here on the left, you're yeah, not restricting intake. The, the, the picture on the top right, you're not restricting intake. It's at about seven centimetres. But in fact, at seven centimetres, even with plants like chicory and plantain, you're now in the lower part of the plant where there's more lignin, so the quality's decreased. And that bottom right photograph there shows you what I want to show you is yes, it's green, it looks got some quality in it, but you see the sparse patches because by grazing to that low, you start killing the plant and you reduce the longevity and therefore the performance and you're reducing intake on the animals. One other graph I just want to show is a study we did where we had the, the herb clover mix versus some lambs on a hunter, which is a leafy turnip. So it's a turnip without a bulb species. The lamb growth rates are the same, but by having a mixed sward, what you see there is even though the growth rates are the same, but you look at the distribution of those growths, and there's about 100 lambs in each group, you see the top one with the herb clover mix, you get a, a less uh, spread, and more of the lambs are more even in terms of their growth. Yes, it's no different than the bottom graph, but you can see there by having a monoculture, it shows the impact of having a monoculture, in other words, a, a sward of just one type, because just like you, when you go to the restaurant, you don't just want one thing, you actually want a mix of things. And you will all differ in what you do and don't like. So when you have a monoculture, you, you have a situation where the animal can't pick and choose, and you'll always have animals that actually don't like what's there. So the bottom scenario, you might look at it and think, oh, well, they grow just the same, but the bottom scenario will cost you money because it's got those lambs growing slowly there at the, the left side of that graph. They're gonna take longer to finish. And that has higher associated costs. So in conclusion, my talk's been sparse in detail and I've used the same pretty much numbers over and over again because much research in New Zealand that's occurred in the last 30 years has found regardless of physiological state, regardless of age of the animal, for ryegrass, white clover and the herb clover mix, the optimal grazing levels are the same. So it's about identifying for every period of the year which of the animals benefit the most from being able to graze that optimum amount of feed. And therefore, which animals within your flock you can push a bit harder because they either have the ability to buffer or at that period of the year, they do not necessarily need to be performing at a high level. Because on your farm, when you go to a herbage only scenario and you're not bringing in those supplements, you will never have enough herbage grown for every class of livestock within the year. And you have variation in pasture covers across your farm. So it's about thinking about identifying the optimal feeding conditions for those animals that need it the most. Thank you. And that's me, Michael. Okay. Um, thank you very much, uh, Paul. Um, really, really good talk there. Um, and very, very interesting uh, as to how you do things in New Zealand. I suppose in a, from an Irish context, um, we often talk about being grass-based, you know, but yet concentrate feed, I suppose, is one of the big, uh, single biggest variable costs that we have on sheep farms. So it, it's interesting to see how you're managing grass and how you're attempting to, to you know, finish your lambs uh, from a herbage-based diet, um, whether that is with some herbal lays or some, um, Brassica crops are, you know, I suppose, as you were saying, in a lot of cases, just from a grass-based diet. We have loads and loads and loads of questions, um, and they're still coming in. So I suppose we're, we're not going to get to the stage uh, where everybody's question is going to be answered, um, because we'll be here for an awful long time. Uh, so we're going to, I, I've picked out a few questions. I'm going to ask them in some cases, they're questions where there, there's been a number of 
uh, of people asking a similar type questions. But what we will do is we will endeavor to come back to everybody in terms of we, we will answer the questions that have been asked um, online after after this event. So, so in the next day or two, and we'll put them up on the website. So uh, chagas, www.chagas.ie forward slash sheepcon21, um, OK? So maybe I might just um, ask Nicola and Paul there just to turn on their, their, their cameras and their mics. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to Nicola first on this. And there's a question here that's come in from a number of different people in, in various different guises, Nicola. And it's how relevant do you think the New Zealand sheep are in an Irish context? And I suppose just to put, maybe to frame that question a bit better, uh, Nicola, you went over to New Zealand in 2019 to, to have a look at answering this question. I mean, would Irish sheep farmers be better off just forgetting about what's in Ireland and going to New Zealand, you know, or was there something here for them? And we've, we've had a couple of questions in that kind of a vein, you know, are they so much superior? You might just answer that there first if you can, Nicola, please. Yeah, thanks, Michael. Um, that's an interesting question, actually. During my time um, in New Zealand, so I went in autumn 2019, I actually, as well as visiting a number of farms, got the chance to collaborate um, with a uh, consultancy company called Abacus Bio. And over there we looked, we generated a model um, and that model was looking at all different scenarios that we could you know, put into practice in Ireland. So whether or not we would look at in, importing New Zealand genetics or should we stick with what we have or a mixture of both or what was the best option to go. And there was actually some very interesting results there. Um, it showed that the benefit in terms of genetics and uh, in economics would be greater for the Irish industry if we stuck with what we had um, rather than importing New Zealand genetics, but that we sourced our genetics off more progressive breeders. So essentially it means that we need uh, commercial farmers to drive demand towards sourcing animals of superior genetics and uh, going from there. So basically what, what I was saying is if we stick with the, the, the system we have, which identifies the elite animals in terms of being five star, um, that was the best way to go for Irish sheep farmers to follow the, 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 the genetic indexes that we have, yes? Yes, yeah, that was the best option, yeah. Okay. Aim to select superior genetics, yeah. Okay, and, and, and just, I, I go, uh, second question with you again, Nicola, and then, I, then I'm going to go over to Paul. Um, and it's, it's a question that I suppose we had a chat about this before the event as well. If the litter size was greatest for the New Zealand um, group, but yet the numbers of lambs weaned was, was, was very similar um, to the elite Irishes, why is there such a difference, you know, a drop off, I suppose, and, and why did the gap close down? You might just explain how the figures, uh, the, the two sets of figures that were there, yeah? Yeah, I suppose there's a couple of different reasons for that. Um, firstly, the litter size, as I presented it, was reported on a pre o lambed basis, um, and the weaning rate then was presented on a per yo joined at mating basis. So that was going to include the barren yos there was going to bring down uh, the weaning rate. Um, as well as that, as I mentioned, we don't let yos to the field with three lambs. And um, so there is going to be a proportion there of lambs that actually are artificially reared or cross fostered onto another yo, which is going to bring down uh, the overall weaning rate as well. Okay. Okay, so um, I, I'm going to switch over to Paul for a minute. I'm going to come back to you, Nicola, just again to say to Perfect. people on the call, we have, we have over 60 questions in. We're, we're not going to get anywhere near 60 questions answered. So we'll have to come back to a lot of people on, on, on their questions. And, you know, you, you just have to bear with us on that one. Um, Paul, one for you. Is four centimetres actually the point at which you're restricting the yo's intake? And, and this question was basically focused on especially twin rearing yaws in lactation. Yeah, so regardless of um, physiological state, once you get below four centimetres, she can't per bite physically fill her mouth. And there's only so many bites she can do in a 24 hour period because she's a ruminant. So once you go below four centimetres, um, you will reduce in intake, which we know from uh, measuring animal performance or using some of the intake tools that uh, Nicola also talked about. 
Okay, and a second question then, which is, is very in a similar vein. So both Eric and Patrick asked this question. How long after lambing are yos in New Zealand set stocked? And, and the second part of that question then is, and when are the lambs usually weaned? At what age are you usually weaning your lambs in, in New Zealand production systems? Okay, so sorry if I was not clear. Set stocking occurs one to two weeks before the start of the lambing period. So it's before lambing. We're allocating ewes to those paddocks. Um, and then they remain in those paddocks. To on average in New Zealand, uh, weaning occurs somewhere between day 90 and 100 from when the first lamb is born. So if we are, are lambing over two cycles of 34 days, then therefore the oldest lamb will be say day 100 at weaning and the youngest lamb might be as low as day 66. And they're all weaned together at the same time. Okay. Okay, back to Nicola again. Nicola, I have, I have a question here. Any differences between the Irish and the New Zealand sheep in terms of lameness or, or other kind of health issues? Are you seeing anything like that just from a practical point of view on the ground? Um, yeah, we actually record this. I haven't. I'm in the final stages of um, looking at the results through statistics, but we record things like lameness and mastitis um, and prolapse and things like that. So it will be interesting to look at the results, but I'm afraid I can't report at this moment in time. And, uh, okay, findings. so... That's something for a future conference uh, yes, in a we, couple of years' time. Yeah. yeah? Okay. We definitely have lots of information on it, yeah, so there'll be some interesting. Yeah. Okay. And then Robin, as well, it's just staying with you, Nicola. Robin asked us um, Do the New Zealand yours carry the GDF9 uh, fecundity gene? Um, yeah, majority of them would um, have carried it, yeah, coming in from New Zealand. And the Irish ones wouldn't, I take it. A uh, majority them probably wouldn't, yeah, which would be accounting for probably some of the difference in the litter size there. Okay, very good. And I'm going to go back to, to Paul again. Um, Paul, we have lots of uh, questions uh, regarding these herbal lays. Um, so Emily was asking, which is most damaging um, winter weather for plantain chicory? Is it frost, wet, um, freezing wind, what, what are you finding in, in, and how are you managing those crops over the winter in New Zealand? Yeah, so, so, so the temperature itself is not a problem. It's the soil being wet and especially in chicory, chicory is the most susceptible and the livestock, in this case sheep, uh, walking on the plant, damaging the crown and, and letting uh, bacteria etc in which kill the plant. So it's not the environmental conditions per se, it's the damage to the plant when it's wet and, and cold, but the animal's walking on it. Okay, so the important thing then is, is keep the animals off it for the winter time? Yes, yep, yep. So we, depending on where you are in New Zealand, it's one to two months in that coldest, wettest period. And are you grazing at bear for the winter? Or are you leaving? Uh, uh, no, so, so we um, are grazing down to that eight centimetres. And okay. then because in the winter, it's gonna grow slower just like any plant when it's colder. So it will not get to, to the time you start grazing in the spring. It, it won't be well above, you know, that 24 centimetres, so that's fine. If it was something like lucerne or alfalfa, I'm not sure what it's called in Ireland, then we'd graze it bare. Okay. And then we have, we have another question here, uh, two similar questions again from Breed and Cecil. Um, do you apply chemical nitrogen um, typically to these herbal lays? And also, how do you control weeds? So, um, yes, we do uh, put nitrogen in, even though that hopefully in the sward um, there's a significant proportion of clover, you know, putting in some nitrogen, but you still need to put nitrogen in. Um, and we do a couple of low doses twice a year. Um, weeds, weeds are an issue. Um, the biggest issue, actually the weed that's the biggest issue is grass. Um, because by not grazing it in the winter, some of our grass species are pro quite active then and they come through. So um, every couple of years, you might have to spray out the grass. Um, but the, the easiest way to control the uh, weed, potential weed infestation is two things. A, having a very high seeding rate. So you, you've got a really dense sward at the start. So it crowds out the potential weed species and then not grazing down too low below eight centimetres, because if you graze down below eight centimetres, you damage the plant, kill the plant, or if you graze in the winter, you kill the plant, 
which results in bare soil and the weed species coming through. So there are management practices that you can put in place to reduce the need of use of any chemical. And I, I suppose a follow on question then, um, Paul from, from Cormac, do you think it's practical to use a herbal lay mix as it's not really as persistent as the ryegrass swar uh, sward? Um, Grazed yeah, so and it can't be grazed during the winter. Sorry. Uh, and what is is the daily live weight gain on these herbal layers com lays compared to a grass clover um, yeah. mix? So very good questions. Um, yes, you can't graze it in the winter. So therefore, our farmers restrict that do use it to say seven to ten percent of their farm because otherwise in the winter there's not enough feed. So you have to restrict how much your farm you can place in it. You can't do greater than that because how are you going to get through that winter feed? So that's a correct ob observation. Um, the second point was usually we get somewhere between 20 to 40% higher productivity uh, lamb growth, whether that's weaned lamb growth um, or whether that's performance on mum. And milk production on mum has been recorded to be up to 40 to 50% greater. Um, but the level of that performance differs in the, in the season. So weaned lamb growth is not much difference if you've got yearling lambs in spring, but, and if you've still got some left from the year before. But the, the greater the difference occurs in terms of performance, lamb, weaned lamb growth in that summer autumn period, because in that period in New Zealand conditions, our grass starts to go reproductive and mature and loses quality. So they are your big two seasons where you get the big advantage. Okay, but by, by just in one of the things you said, do, do most sheep farmers in New Zealand have herbal lays or are there, you know, you said on average, where they're there, they're about 7% uh, of the pasture? So, no, so it depends on where you are in the country. So in the North Island, um, there's increasing use of the, the, the herb mixes um, and in the northern part of the South Island, but then there are other bits of the country based on the soil type where a pure lucerne sward or a pure red clover sward might be more suitable. So it's, we would say in New Zealand, it's horses for courses. So it very much does depend where you are and also does depend on the topography of your farm. Clearly, if you're in a uh, large hill country farm, then cultivation can be a difficulty. But we are seeing increasing uses of it, yes, in those areas that can. Okay. Okay, I'm going to go back to, to Nicola again and just a quick question for you, Nicola, here on... Um, you compared um, Irish and New Zealand sheep. Um, any uh, plans or, or why are we not looking at French or, or say, um, UK sheep uh, and comparing those or anything like that in the pipeline or anything like that happening? Yeah, I suppose um, essentially when the project started, uh, we could have imported UK or French genetics. But the main reason is because uh, we already have shared genetics with those countries where it's many, many years, if ever, there has been, you know, lots of New Zealand genetics in Ireland. And um, there has been other research which is being published as well uh, by Sean Fitzmaurice of Chagas, who looks at the, the differences there between the UK, France and Ireland. OK, OK. Um, just back to Paul again. Paul, can I ask you... Um, uh, we have a very good system in Ireland for, for assisting farmers that want to measure grass. Um, it's called Pasture Base Ireland. And OK, we have probably lots of, of dairy farmers on it, not so much. On the sheep side, we have a number of very interested sheep farmers, but uh, numerically they're quite low compared to the 35 or 6,000 sheep farmers that are in the country. Um, what's the position in, in New Zealand? Are, are all the sheep farmers over there running around with plate meters and sword sticks measuring and, um, you know, and using that information? Um, so the, the numbers of farmers using pasture mass information is increasing year on year. Um, but remember, some of our farms are very large, uh, Michael, and using tools such as a sword stick or a plate uh, are not that suitable on large uh, farms with, with many, many paddocks. So what, what you tend to find is our farmers calibrate themselves um, over time with a plate or a, or a stick and then just do it visually. Um, and there's increasing use of uh, feed budgeting tools, um, which farmers use to uh, predict um, future pasture covers and they're always being readjusted with actual covers. So 
and more and more farmers are using those electronic uh, feed budgeting tools. And therefore that requires more and more farmers to be some form of measurement of, of uh, pasture mass or height. And you don't need to use a plate meter or a stick if you get yourself calibrated. And it's relatively easy to do that over a shortest period. Okay. Okay, um, look, at we're, we're uh, 10 minutes over time. Um, I'm going to uh, call a halt to the proceedings this evening just to say a few thank yous, just a few reminders. The, this um, virtual sheep conference has been recorded and the recording will be available on the Chagas uh, website, so www.chagas.ie. Um, you can find the proceedings, the papers, um, which our speakers have written, um, and that's also on that uh, link, uh, chagas.ie forward slash sheepcon21. And if you go to the bottom left-hand side of that page, there'll be a link to click and that'll bring you into the area where you'll get the PDF for the conference proceedings for tonight's papers and also for Thursday night's papers. Um, we will endeavor to, to, to answer or to, 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 to our best to answer all the questions. We have over 70 questions. Um, so we'll have a look at the ones that weren't answered on, online here and we'll endeavor to, to put an answer to them um, over the, the next couple of, of, of days. I just want to thank our speakers, uh, Nicola Featherstone, who, who, who works with us in Chagask, is a, a Welsh scholar, and Paul Kenyon. I think he did a great job, a uh, very informative paper, very interesting topics. Um, I'd like to thank our PR team for, for helping us to host this um, virtual sheep conference, um, all the advertising links, everything, and my colleague Declan McArdle, who is our computer whiz filming person who's, who's made this happen. The sheep uh, program team, my colleagues in both research and, and knowledge transfer, um, who organize this event every year. Normally we, we run two events uh, in various different um, venues around the country. This is our first year going virtual. Um, you know, and I suppose, you know, I think it's been quite a good success. We've had just short of 700 people on tonight. Um, as I said, the proceedings can be found uh, and we'll try and answer any questions. Um, look at lastly, I suppose I want to thank you all, the audience, for tuning in tonight. Um, we hope you have found it informative. Um, again, look at, we'll try to get to your questions over the next couple of days and you can look back at any part of the conference um, it'll be up in the next day or two on chagas.ie. Thank you all and good night.